live on Facebook, and um, I'd like to welcome Lawrence Millman, who is who lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he's burning going to be burning the midnight oil. Uh, he's a mycologist, Arctic explorer, and is the author of eighteen books including such titles as Last Places, A Kayak Full of Ghosts, Goodbye Ice, Lost in the Arctic, and the latest one, Funga Media, which hopefully he'll promote today and give us some information on how it can be obtained. It was published by Princeton Press. In the North, he has done mycological work in Nunavik, Yukon, East Greenland, Iceland, and the Hudson Bay area. He has a polypo named after him, I notice, Milmani, and will soon have a velvet worm named after him. I'm curious <laughs> uh, about that one. Anyway, I welcome you, Lawrence, and uh, you have the floor. Very well, thank you very much, uh, David. Um, the book is entitled Fungipedia, not Fungimedia. Uh, no, no, I said pedia, but maybe I'm it, slurring. It sounded like media to me, and, and I am uh, averse to the media, uh, and it's averse to me. So uh, Fungipedia, and it's Idenotis Milmanii. Uh, uh, the gentleman who named it uh, suggested uh, Milmania, but I thought that that would be a little bit uh, vulgar. So it's Milmanii. Anyway, you were curious about a velvet worm. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh, they're called onocophorins, and they're ancient creatures who crawled out of the sea, oh, who knows how many millions of years ago, and they're found only in high latitudes in uh, the tropics and uh, either they're sort of a combination of a worm and an insect, and they blow out uh, a sort of, if they see something they want to eat, they lasso it. Uh, out, out of their antenna comes this slimy fluid, uh, like a lasso, and it wraps around, well, don't worry, it won't be you, uh, uh, a beetle, um, uh, and it wraps around and holds the beetle. And uh, I found a species of Anacophora new to science in Honduras some years ago. And uh, it will soon be named, uh, named after me. I think Tony, Tony has a raised hand. No, I think he just got that up. It's been there some time. Oh, he's the raised hand or the note? No, <laughs> no, just uh, ignore that for the time okay. being. All right, very good. And uh, we'll use um, Lawrence's uh, topic is cold comfort, the psycho work, fungi in the cold. It's not psycho, Lawrence, is it? No, uh, it's not. Shall I begin? I yes, I please. Share your screen. Share my screen. Okay. And let me know if there's anything else uh, I need to do. That's it. I shall start it right now. This is called the Psycho Ward. Uh, I suppose you could subtitle it Cold Comfort. Um, whenever possible, I head north. Friends invariably say, too bad, you're go not going to find any fungi there. And how wrong they are. Uh, but they can be forgiven for being wrong. For the north, the subarctic and the arctic uh, is the most mycologically unexplored of any compass point. Its fungi are called either psychrotropes or psychrophiles, which means they're adapted to the cold or adapted to avoid the cold. Hence the title of this presentation, which has nothing to do with the Alfred Hitchcock film. Let me add that much of what I say about fungi of high latitudes also pertains to fungi of high altitudes, although I don't discuss the, the latter because I'm a high latitude rather than a high altitude person. 
Here are drift logs on the remote island north of Iceland and east of Greenland called Jan Mayan land. And this is perhaps, believe it or not, uh, the ultimate substrate for psychrophiles. Um, these logs, uh, having floated up a Siberian river into the Arctic gyre, uh, and then down one of the drifts, like the East Greenlandic drift, remain in ice cold water for several hundred years, and then on the strand for an almost equally long time. Now, what does this have to do with fungi, you might ask? Um, well, it has quite a bit. Most of the spores and mycelia in the logs are still viable after such a lengthy time. As mycologist Bob Blanchett and I documented in a paper entitled Fungi in Arctic Drift Logs in Fungal Ecology. And I think that was 2017. They have no, as you can see, they have no fruiting bodies yet. Um, they were viable, their spores removed, they were DNA'd as were the mycelia, no fruiting bodies yet, but I expect may, there will be many fruitings in the climate changed future. As for actual fruiting bodies, Northern species are usually the same as species in temperate regions. There's only about a 2% endemism in the North. But species there have different adaptations from species down south. For one thing, they're often more gregarious than their temperate colleagues, uh, partially because individuals produce fewer spores than those colleagues do. So fewer spores means group mentality. Uh, an equivalent might be, uh, I don't know what you could say, Merasmus is on your front lawn that fruit by numbers uh, there in the morning and desiccated by the late afternoon. Uh, instead of one staunch agaricus producing a certain amount of spores, there are quite a few tiny delicate marasmiuses which together produce quite a lot of spores. Uh, anyway, here's an example of their gre gregarious growth habit. This is a Claveridelphus, um, that I photographed in the Yukon a few years ago. And uh, I couldn't, I, my, the angle of my camera could not get the entire width. This is only about a quarter of the scene, so to speak. Um, um, there are fewer fungal species in the North and temperate regions, but they make up for that fact with their biomass. Uh, biomass, keyword, as is shown here. I was once in the uh, Siberian tundra and I saw just an incredible ocean of bolites. And I felt that uh, if I was somewhat more light weighted, I could actually walk on them for a considerable distance. Um, I might add that there are four times as many fungal species as species of vascular plants in the Arctic, above the Arctic Circle, but this is rapidly changing. I'm going to begin uh, by talking a bit about human users of fungi in the psychro world. As, as uh, David might have suggested, with one hat, I'm an Arctic ethnographer hanging out with Northern First Nation peoples. And I've hung out with these individuals quite a bit, like these, uh, this Inuk um, who lived in a caribou hide tent in the tundra in Nunavut uh, and was one of the last nomadic Inuit. Uh, this uh, was early 1990s. Uh, and I collected all sorts of lore from such people, like this woman. 
a hundred year old Vuntut Gwichid woman named Annie Henry from the Northern Yukon. Note her ebullience. Uh, I wrote an article for Fungi, by the way, in which I vaguely alluded to the fact that one of the ways one can solve the dilemma of COVID and not get oneself twisted into a knot of anxiety is be by being similarly ebullient. In any event, beside her, and I think you can see it, I don't, I, I didn't think my cursor will work, uh, but it's right here at about the eight o'clock mark on the image. Uh, there you will see uh, the false tinder polypore, Felinus ignearius, which Northern people call CHEW, C-H-E-W. Um, like native people in her neighboring Alaska, she will burn the polypore down to ash, wrap a to tobacco leaf around it, and she'll place the combination in her mouth, whereupon, voila, she gets a nicotine high from the wedding of an alkaloid and an alkaloid entity. I asked her how long she'd been doing this. She looked thoughtful for a moment, then said, oh, for about 90 years. Now, in parts of Nunavut, mushrooms are regarded as the anak. Uh, the kind word uh, is poop the anak of shooting stars. And that's because shooting stars leave a trail of detritus behind them in the fall. And the next morning, there are mushrooms on the tundra. Ergo, the mushrooms are the stars anak. In East Greenland, where I took this picture, um, mushrooms are called kivitok sopa. Kivitok sopa. A kivitok is a flying cannibal who lives in the mountains uh, and will fly down, if you're not careful, and close your windows into your village, into your house, grab a person and make off with it, uh, drying it and eating it for later use. Uh, not a very nice type of individual, I'm sure you would agree. Sopa, S-O-P-A, is soap. So in this case, not in the case of this specimen though, which is a lactarius, in this case, the slime often found on mushrooms, both in the north and elsewhere, uh, is the sopa. And it is thought that since the Kivik talk have no access to actual soap, uh, being mountain hermits, they use this slime to wash themselves with. Uh, and the slime, by the way, uh, is, serves as an antifreeze as the fall progresses, wherever you happen to be, more and more slimy mushrooms put in an appearance. Um, and it protects the mushroom from the cold. So uh, in East Greenland and other parts of the North, actual mushrooms are considered, as you can imagine from this picture, horrid entities. Well, as you perhaps know, Northern native people tend to be short and robust, relatively close to the ground, or in this instance, close to the ground in an ATV. Um, this is not cold tolerance, it's cold avoidance. As is the case with this Amanita from Hudson Strait. It's probably Amanita Greenlandii. This morphology not only helps with it avoid the cold, but also helps something that could be considered, at least in the Arctic, even worse, and that's strong winds. Um, because they might not, they might not just topple the fruiting body, 
but they would blow the spores of that fruiting body far, far from the appropriate substrate. So being close to the ground and somewhat robust is a virtue. Um, it also means more humidity, the humidity produced by one's fertile surface. Um, let me add, I mean, the fact of the matter is that uh, this is an often forgotten about fact uh, in mushrooms, regardless of where one happens to be, uh, because uh, once a mushroom fruits, uh, the humidity on the underside really aids and abets spore production. Any event, um, let me add the temperature of the ground, which it's close to, uh, as well as the soil out of which it's growing is much higher than the air temperature. So in Northern tundras, all woody plants have mycorrhizal partners. This is one of the most common of those plants, the dwarf birch, uh, Betula nana. And you can see, I immediately identify the leaves as birch leaves. Uh, mycelia connect with its roots, of course. Uh, and there's the usual exchange of nutrients, but very important, the mycelia of northern fungi are an, do an infinitely better job of getting nitrogen from the nitrogen, uh, nitrogen deprived soil than the plant's own roots do. Um, indeed, at least 80% of the nitrogen a plant obtains in the Arctic comes from its fungal partners. Without those partners, life would be difficult, if not downright impossible. Dwarf shrubs like this mountain avens, Dryas octopetata, beautiful plant, would be among the now common species that would cease to exist without a fungal partner. And it has both ecto and endo mycorrhizal partners uh, from which it gets nitrogen from the soil, not to mention, of course, phosphorus as well. Many Arctic mushrooms are, this is seldom written about, um, but in my experience, it's absolutely true, are bigger than their temperate colleagues. Uh, like this Lixinum I photographed in Scoresby Sun in northeastern Greenland, well, well above the Arctic Circle. After all, big mushrooms, like big animals, do a good job of dealing with the cold because they have a more efficient surface area to volume ratio. In the case of this Lixinum, as well as certain other members of the Boli family, they have sterile tubes adjacent to their fertile tubes. The former serves as a Parker-like protectant for the latter. And I couldn't find it, uh, but I wanted to put, I have a, a, a photo where I'm holding in East Greenland, an even larger Lixinum in one hand and a muskox skull in the other and the Lixinum dwarfs the muskox skull. And many Arctic mushrooms are smaller than the same species from down south. Here I am in a place you probably don't know about, a uh, very remote place called Pingualuit Crater in Nunavik, down on my knees looking, in fact, for small species. And uh, that's not really a beard, it's a mosquito net around my head. And I found this Rusula. Uh, and although the photo doesn't, a friend of mine I was with took the photo. Um, uh, it's about the size of a Mycena. Um, and a good example of the fact that 
many Arctic fungi are smaller than their temperate colleagues, although they too, as you can see, huddle close to the ground. And uh, let me add that speaking of small size, all Arctic microfungi like the pathogen, pathogenic genus Mycosphorella uh, are self-fertile and which saves them time and trouble of developing a teleomorph. There may be a question regarding that statement. Now, back to, um, uh, hmm, I think I missed something. Okay. Okay, here, this is probably uh, a Xeromphalina. And I have sort of moved the moss, uh, the substrate away, so I could take a film of this uh, uh, picture of the stipe. It's using that substrate as a protectant against the cold. Temperatures in the moss can be as much as 40% warmer than in the surrounding air. Um, so another parka, so to speak. And maybe it has some sort of symbiotic relationship with the moss, or maybe it's an endophyte. Um, the same question, by the way, has been answered, uh, has been asked about hygrosopes. And some individuals have actually thought that they might be uh, symbionts with moss, similar to the way in which fungi are symbi symbionts with algae. But uh, there has yet been a resolution of that issue. Uh, now here, this is the picture you saw before, uh, not so cute. And here is indeed another lexinum using moss as a protectant. Uh, you could say it has two parkas, one in its sterile tubes and another is the moss. And you know, uh, there are many, many different species of moss that are being used as parkas. Uh, one of the most common is sphagnum moss. Um, hmm. This, uh, let's see. Okay. Here is uh, what I was what I was showing you actually was um, this is a Tefala species. I have it in a different place in my notes. That's why I was skipping around, and it's another uh, basidio, um, and they're called snow molds. You may know, small, know snow molds because they're winter pathogens of cereals. They have antifreeze activity in their hyphae, and that helps them deal with cold conditions, of course. And I should mention, speaking of hyphae, that the dark septate hyphae of many Arctic fungal species are a protection against the cold. Those hyphae, many of them at least, contain melanin as do many perenomycetes in more temperate regions, which is why Hypoxlons and company seem perfectly happy in the winter. Okay, now here we have a Basidio lichen. Uh, it's uh, lichen, um, Lichenophalia umbilifera, um, and it consists Unlike most lichens, I think only 5% of them are basidial lichens. It has a basidial mycete rather than an asco combining into its partnership with an algae. But the farther north you go, the more basidial lichens you find. And what I was actually looking for in this scene, I was looking for them. Uh, and I found five different Basidio lichen species in this area. Um, uh, 
where I live, I've found one or two over the years. But at any rate, uh, this is one of them uh, that I found in that area. It is very interesting. Uh, like other lichens, um, basidial lichens are what's known as extremophiles. And they can shut down when the going gets rough. Shut down, but not die. Uh, and they are, um, I find, very fetching fungi, if, you know, I have to be alliterative. Now, here's another one. Uh, and the substrate is not my blue jeans, but moss. Uh, you might recognize this species. It's a basidial lichen called Arhenia lobata from near Kenyuk-Sujuak in Nunavuk. And I am a great fan of Arhenias. I can't even explain why. It's possibly because they're so frequently overlooked. Uh, but in 1819, they were not overlooked. The first fungal collection ever made in Canada, which was made by the Perry Arctic Expedition in 1890, 1819, sorry, was of an Arfhenia lobata. It was then put with the chanterelles. I mean, one can perhaps see why looking at the ridges, why that uh, miscalculation was made. Uh, I should say, though, and more recently in Svalbard, I met a Russian who kept eating this inedible basidial lichen on the assumption that it was a chanterelle. I could not convince him that it wasn't. Uh, we got into an argument, and he finally beat his chest with his fist and said, I, Russian. Uh, that was his response to my saying, what makes you think you know so much about fungi? Um, so that ended the conversation. Needless to say, it is not a chanterelle. Uh, this is an asco lichen, the so-called mac lichen, Rhizocarpon geographicum. And I took that photo in northern Nunavut as well. Uh, sorry, Nunavik, not Nunavut. Arctic specimens have been documented as being upwards of 4,000 years old. And you can actually determine, you know, in, in actually looking at something like this will tell you something, which is namely you can determine the age of certain lichens like this one because they have a consistent growth rate growing in uh, endless circles or semicircles. This, um, and this uh, documentation, you can document a lot of things. Um, uh, it's used to date rock surfaces from both an archeological and geological perspective. You take the growth rate of the lichen and you know, measure what, what it would grow you know, toward the beginning, toward the middle years of its life and so on, and come up with a ballpark figure of its substrate. Um, Often this is because the lichen got its first nitrogen fix from a bird perching on the uh, substrate that uh, is an upright stone uh, and the bird poops and that's where the nitrogen fix comes. So you assume that's when the lichen began growing. And I uh, saw an Inuit burial cairn on Mansell Island in Hudson Bay and I tried to figure out, there was the same species of lichen growing on. I tried to figure out, okay, how old is the cairn? How long ago did the uh, truly Inuit inhabitant live? And I dated it as about 550 years old. And uh, I was reasonably close. I talked later to an archeologist who said, we've determined it's about 590 years old. So what we have here, um, now this is very interesting. Um, uh, 
you can't really tell this substrate because uh, it's sort of oozy, but it's a northern substrate softer than rock. Uh, moose dung. And uh, this is a Chylomenia coprenarius cup fungus in moose dung in subarctic Labrador. Um, what is not to like, I have to ask you, for that dung can be wet, warm, and nutrient rich. Many psychrophiles produce substantial amounts of trehalose, which is a carb that makes cell membranes flexible so they're less likely to freeze. Now here's a good example, Hemoloma volutipes. Most hemolobas are splendid trehalose producers, and thus you can find them all across the north. And that's why Henry Baker, B-E-K-E-R, the world's leading hemoloma expert, has spent more time in the north than almost any other mycologist. Here's another even more familiar volutipes, the velvet foot flamulina volutipes. It's the East Coast version of your flamulina populicola. And I'm fairly certain I have, I've seen this uh, in the Northern, Northern BC and the Yukon. So I'm fairly certain you have it uh, in your neck of the woods. And it produces glycerol, which is a sugar alcohol compound, which combined with triolose, allows it to do just fine in cold conditions, including cold conditions in temperate regions. And, you know, it uh, has no problem whatsoever fruiting in snow. Um, uh, the snow melt itself probably is better than the snow in that it is moisture, it, it gives moisture and humidity. Which is butter, a tremella species, which the Inuit in the central Canadian Arctic think or used to think was a byproduct of the snot of caribou. Like most jellies, it freezes, dries, rehydrates, freezes, rehydrates again, dries again, and can do this six or seven times before it decides to hell with this. Um, this makes it an excellent psychrophile. Its basidia are buried deep in its fruiting body, unlike most other basidiomycetes. Uh, so it doesn't buy the farm when it freezes or when it dries out. It also has extremely long sterigmata, which extend from the deeply buried basidia to the surface of the fruiting body. Um, I decided to include uh, a mountain species, Hygrophorus gritsii, because it has cold active proteases in its cells. It begins fruiting under a blanket of snow, no problem, it melts its way upwards as it expands. Then it rises heroically above its substrate. With the diminution of snow, it's now been proposed for the global red list of fungi. I dare say there's someone in the audience who knows vastly more about this species than I do, and who may indeed correct something, who knows what I may have remarked upon. And now for a change, climate change. The North is melting two or three times faster than the rest of the planet. Here is something that would not have been seen previously. Uh, I took this picture in 2015 in Tassilak, East Greenland. Kids are swimming in a 
well, in a pond, you could say. And uh, I told the mother that she should get a lifeguard. What's a lifeguard, she asked me. I ought to say that temperature increase does not affect fungi directly. Warming changes the whole biotic community, which is what affects the fungi. Receding and or melting glaciers create entirely new habitats for fungi. This is the Ascomycete Helvella corium, which I photographed in the debris left by a melting glacier on Daff Baffin Island. It's probably never been documented this far north. You should look for more ascos like this one in departing glaciers because they tend to be pioneer species in new habitats. Doubtless their spores were dispersed to Baffin from some temperate locale. Now this is a Cortinaria species and uh, I'm not going to try to identify it because that's not the point and not the point of this talk either, which is not about systematics, but about fungal ecology. Um, with change, or I might say greening, there's a longer growing season for uh, fungi in the Arctic. I took this uh, photo of a Cortinarius in Greenland in late June. This is a remarkably early time for a fleshy species so far north. With warming, plants are taller, like this Arctic willow, Salix arctica. Even as you can see, its catkins are taller too. And with warming, mushrooms are getting taller too. There's less cold and wind to contend with like the Samanita, which is indeed the same species I showed you earlier, probably Amanita greenlandii, uh, I showed you early that was hugging the ground. Oops. So, um, with, you know, more and pl more plants are heading north, more vascular plants are heading north, um, sorry, and, uh, and more mycorrhizal species are heading north with them. But the melting of the permafrost may have a negative effect on these species. Why? Because that melting released vast amounts of nitrogen into the soil and burgeoning plant communities won't need the nitrogen bequeathed to them by mycorrhizal species. The result, both plants and fungi might find themselves compromised rather than achieving optimal growth. As you can see, optimal growth is in this photo. Uh, let me give you an analogy. Acid rain, uh, starting in maybe the 60s and maybe even continuing to this day, brought lots of nitrogen to the soil and trees which had previously depended upon their fungal partners for nitrogen, dismissed those partners because they said, hey, we don't need to provide these guys with uh, carbs. They're getting nitrogen free of charge. Um, so what happened was, well, this was a somewhat bad mistake on the part of the tree, but one that one could possibly um, uh, imagine happening. 
you know, both the trees and their partners either became very, very compromised or did not survive. Uh, I put this in as an analogy for the increased nitrogen in the soil uh, that is the result of the melting of the permafrost. In uh, northern boreal forests, there's been uh, a recent die off of birch trees, as this photo would seem to indicate. Rapid temperature fluctuations in the winter are causing a high degree of wounding in the birches, with death usually the consequence. And I should add that this is very true in my native New England, uh, where birch trees are, um, well, you're finding far more corpses than ever before. But when a plant or tree dies, sapro, we call them saprobes, that's the mycological term for saprophyte. Saprobes arrive like this usually saprophytic birch polypore, Fomatopsis betulinus, a species that is becoming increasingly common in boreal forest. Um, more plants mean more plant injuries, of course, which mean more fungi taking advantage of those injuries. Uh, fungi are, after all, are opportunists. Terrestrial lichens like this Cladonia species can't compete with vast hordes of newcoming vascular plants, which show slowly but surely take over their habitat. And not just lichens will buy the proverbial farm. Because the Cladonias are almost the exclusive winter food of caribou, and because they in, those caribou can increasingly not find this winter food during, due to its sparsity, they end up starving like this poor creature here. Uh, in Nunavik, and you know, I had it. I had it analyzed, and it did die of starvation. Um, let me add that even if they can find that winter food, they can't dig through the increasingly frozen winter rain to procure it. Their hooves are not adapted to such excavating. Uh, in the old days, all they needed to do was dig through the snow which was an easy act for their hooves. I should add that in Labrador in the last 30 or so years, there has been a dramatic decline of caribou for a number of reasons. Uh, the reason I've just described is one of them. And another reason is that snow melt uh, occurs much earlier. So there are pools for mosquitoes much earlier. In the past, maybe June, there would still be plenty of snow on the ground. That's when the caribou cows would uh, give birth to calves and then they could tutor their calves. Now the mosquitoes that are flourishing in June uh, go all out in their attacks on both the cows and the calves. And I've often seen skeletal calves wandering about, looking absolutely baffled about their place in the world. There are, of course, a multitude of question marks with respect to the effects of climate change or climate chaos on fungi in the north. Some species might benefit from it, others will not. One thing is pretty certain, however, a diminution and probably a disappearance of psycho psychrophilic adaptations. As I've said, 
several times before. There isn't much endemism in the North with respect to fungi. So it mightn't be long before Northern fungi and those in temperate regions will be the same. And then it'll be goodbye to the Psychro Ward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. That's excellent. Um, can you um, stop so, your sh screen sharing? I just did. All right, great, super. Everybody's up. Everybody stay muted, please. And if you want to talk, just press your pause button um, and um, your space bar and hold it down as you talk. Now, um, Kurt, you've got some questions coming your way. So if you could. Uh, yeah, right now, we just have one from Tony. If he's available, you can maybe uh, add, uh, talk to Lawrence. Uh, I'm just wondering, you're showing that pictures of the birch. I was wondering if uh, shagar or inotus uh, obliquitus is found in the birch up in the north. Well, I, th I, I, I haven't documented chaga to any large degree, but uh, I would say in all likelihood, it would become uh, more frequent. Uh, I have, by the way, written about something that I think is far more interesting than chaga, which is... Uh, the fruiting body of the Inonotus obliquus, which is a little grayish corticeoid species that essentially grows under the birch bark. Um, and, you know, the, the chaga is uh, not a fruiting body. You will never find it producing spores in a million years. Um, you could call it a false conch. Uh, uh, there are several different names for it. But this little gray, you know, seemingly um, modest entity uh, is the fruiting body. The mycelium produces the chaga because it's sending into this uh, false conch, so to speak, various uh, of the defense chemicals that the birch is creating to try to ward off the mycelium, the polypore. And those defense chemicals are metastasized. Uh, humans collect them and put them in a drink and voila. Um, you know, whatever disease they have is cured. I personally think that chaga, chaga uh, is at its most healthiest when mixed with vodka. <laughs> okay, I think Sinclair has a question. Yes. A quick question. The <laughs> Claveria delphus that you showed us was that Claveria delphus from from Cadiz? No, no. Um, I think it was Occidentalis. I'm not. I have to think back. But there there were two in that area, and I think it was Claveria delphus. Uh, it didn't. Does not. I don't think it had a truncate cap. Did Did you eat it? No, I did not eat it. I was too busy admiring it. <laughs> I think Kathy has a question. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hey, I really enjoyed that. I love seeing those habitats. Those yeah. Things. I'm a cold climate person as well. And I, I am a cold. I, I commonly talk about, I mean, this friend has invited uh, me to Costa Rica uh, in <laughs> July and the thought of being in a hot, humid place. Uh, uh, I, and he said, I know you, you end up being nothing but a puddle of water. Um, and I said, at best. I, I agree. I couldn't do it. I am not a tropical mycologist, not at no. all. I, no. My husband is an avalanche expert and my, my stepdaughter goes to Antarctica. Um, nice all the way, all year round. So yeah, we're a cold blooded family. Well, but anyway, I really, I really enjoy that. And um, it's interesting because here I am in Montana and then I collect all the way down into Colorado, not far from New Mexico and Arizona border. And I could pick out at least four of the fungi that you showed that we find on the mountaintops in Colorado 
and mm -hmm. uh, in Montana. I mean, hundreds of miles from the Arctic. Right. Well, yeah. I have it. I was going to talk about, but decided not because I didn't want to make the talk too ethno. But I had a slide of uh, Amanita muscarias, red cap variety from the Siberian tundra. And I was going to talk a little bit about the uses by the Chukchi, but I decided enough is enough. But we find the red cap version uh, all the way down to Colorado and New Mexico as well. Uh, even actually, I think into Mexico and Central America. Ah, okay. Well, you had um, Cortinarius alpinus, which is a very famous Cortinarius. Mm -hmm. um, we see that all the way down the Rocky Mountains, you know, all the way to Colorado. Um, Arrhenia lobata, Amanita greenlandica. We don't you, get that in Montana, but in Colorado. Do you get the Arrhenia in Col Colorado as well? Yes, we do. And it can be very common at times. Really? Um, I remember collecting some years with um, Aegon Horak down there. And when the streams don't scour the sides of the moss, then you can have Arrhenia lobata all up and down the stream banks. But if you have a certain runoff where it scours it more, you won't see a one. It's it's really interesting. interesting. Yeah. Are you finding it primarily at altitude where the stream or the stream banks at altitude or this is this more low line? It's at altitude, but I have seen it um, below tree line as well. But we, <laughs> we are above tree line with that. And yeah, and it's quite common. And also um, Arrhenia uh, or scalpium. Do you scalpium, like yes. Looks like a little spoon, just a few millimeters high. I love that fungus. That is, it's like a little spoon with about four gills. Oh, Kathy, you know what we should do? We, we should find, found an Arrhenia club. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it, it, you know, they're, they're, as far as I know, there isn't one in the world. And you know, they're, they're, they're ignored or they're not admired. And I think that um, we should bring them to the attention, if not the general, to the general public, at least Mycophiles. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a fascinating fungus. I, I, I'm probably not supposed to say if I just reviewed maybe an article on those, so I better. Oh, you did? Was I, it? Uh, I, uh, reviewers uh, are supposed to keep their mouth shut, so I should probably not say that. But, um, well, they're known in Spain. Uh, there are a lot of them in Spain, but in, in the mountains. Was the article, you don't have to name the article, but where, what was the locale or was it sort of the general locale? I, I think I'm going to pass because I probably shouldn't have said anything on that. Whoops, something uh, happened on my screen. Oh, well. No, anyway. Maybe my screen. Hey, David. I can see you. It's not you. It's Kathy. Oh, it says we can't find your camera. Maybe my camera? it's killed me. Learn more. Yeah, I got that as well. I'm not sure. We've all got the same message. Um, I don't know why this is happening, but it... Um, let me see if I can, we've been told that this has been happening with some sites when they've got an intruder in. Let me uh -oh. see if I can resolve it. Um, no cameras are attached. Uh, did your camera stop? Um, I can see everybody, but I can't see. Well, uh, it, it may just be that if we can, if I can, if I can see people on the right hand, uh, yeah. but nothing in the middle, then we can continue on uh, as if it were okay, since it's the verbiage rather than the. Yeah, we're back. Go. It's back. Yeah. Good. I fixed yeah. it. That's right. I, I fixed but, it, Adolf. Oops. Can Adolf I... and Aluna, do you want to ask a question? Yes. Uh, um, Aluna wonders if you uh, saw or collected uh, Lichen Omphalia, yellow Lichen of Omphalia. It would be Alpina. something like uh, Lichen Omphalia alpina. Uh, I know the species, but I've never collected it in the Arctic. 
I, I know it, but uh, alas, I've never collected it. I, I would like to. Uh, we have some on the top of Observatory Hill, 200 meters. Good, good. Um, uh, I, how long ago did you find it? You're, you're muted. Oh, I, uh, oh, yeah, okay. We, we found it just recently and uh, 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 we, we are not sure about the identification. But it's not. But we have it before there too, I think one or twice yeah. during uh, Aluna's study. Yeah. Aluna, do you want to say something? Luna says not really, but it was, <laughs> it was great. I am on the mic. very perceptive comment. I enjoyed it very much the talk of Lawrence. Luna it enjoyed great. it. Great, really great. But Thank uh, you very much. Lawrence, uh, still you owe uh, oh, uh, yeah, one beer to Bruce beer. Bruce Pendergast. I do, and and I I even talked to David on the phone. That I, I, I would love to come across uh, to Canada sometime in the not too distant future. I, I have an ongoing inventory of Yukon fungi for Bruce Bennett, which whom you know. Uh, but I don't know if I can actually uh, get into Canada or to the Yukon. But I was thinking if I could, I would uh, travel by way of Vancouver Island and then head up north. Uh, I have a friend in Dawson City he said, who said that with respect to my getting into Canada and or um, the Yukon, I should tell the customs officials this, that I am performing, and this is the key word now, essential, I am performing an essential service. I will be documenting fungi in the Yukon, uh, essential service. I don't know that would work, work with the customs officials. No, no, never mention fungi to the custom officers. No, no, this was a very bad experience. Oh, and I had a very good experience because I hadn't, um, this was years ago and I was coming down from Nunavik and I couldn't, uh, I wanted to keep some of my fungi in a paper cup and I was coming into the US and a custom, what do you have in the cup? The custom uh, official said. Uh, and uh, I had to open it and showed him mushrooms. And he said, well, you know, actually what I should do is confiscate them. But he spoke in an accent. He said, but you have taken me back to my boyhood in Hungary, where I spent all my time hunting for mushrooms. So you are free to go. Anybody else with any questions? Can I Kathy, ask? Go one? ahead. Go oh. ahead, Kathy. <laughs> I'm hogging a bit. So, no. Lawrence, in all your uh, travels to all those different exotic places, did you have a sense that you were kind of seeing the same set of fungi over and over again? Do you think you saw, are there differences across the Arctic where you were? Um, or maybe it's too hard to get a sense of that, but I fly from Montana or Colorado to Greenland and I'm picking the same species. I, I agree. The only thing, yeah, I, I find the same species and I do a double take, but initially I look at something and because it's either a slightly different size or different shape or hugging the ground more closely, my initial thought is, oh, well, that's a different species. But then when I pick it and examine it, I realize, well, this is the same one that I saw just last week in Massachusetts. Yeah, it just looks a little different. Yeah. It just looks a little different, yes. <laughs> that's right. Um, there are no, right. there are, in fact, as far as I know, there are no uh, endemic genera of fungi in the Arctic. Well, that's very interesting because you know, there's there's a couple ways to look at that. Maybe no endemism uh, on what in one hand, but when you go to all these places, you see the same set of fungi over and over, and you get a sense that there's an arctic uh, fungus or flora, whatever you want to call it. 
because you keep seeing the same thing again and again. And they, each species may not be endemic, but you see the same group of species over and over again. So I find that fascinating. Is I this do too. I, I used in, a, in a another talk I gave, almost I said almost the same thing. <clears throat> and I quoted uh, Yogi Berra. And I said, you get the sense as Yogi Berra once said, it's deja vu all over again. <laughs> That's right. That's a good line. That's right. It's there good... are there are a few species such as um, uh, some of the small lactarii, um, Lactarius nanus, and some others that are only found with dwarf willow. Uh huh. And those dwarf willow were only found in the Arctic or the Alpine, so they at least have a, a limited range. So there's a few. Oh. Just yeah. because of the host that they're with, the host is- Oh yeah. I, I in Yan Mayan, uh, where there's, uh, I don- donate specimens to the far lower barium at Harvard, and I found a unidentifiable inosibi in <laughs> Yan odd. Mayan land. And I mean, one could argue, I know why you're smiling, one could argue that it's not, all inosibis are unidentifiable. Uh, <laughs> But, <laughs> excuse me, uh, but I think it's probably a new species of anosophy mm-hmm. uh, and maybe. Well, you know. we've published about maybe now, I don't know, 10 new species from the um, Arctic alpine habitats. And oh, really? I work with Ellen Larson a lot and she's oh, yeah. from Sweden and, yeah. and Yukavaras from Finland. And so the three of us, it's amazing that uh, Ellen will do the molecular and what they have matches what I have. I mean, it's yep. it's really amazing. It really is amazing. Yeah. Yes, intercontinental distribution. Yeah, Jeff, just following up, just you following up on a that, question. Uh, yeah, yeah, if you look at the chat room, you'll see some people putting some interesting information up. I'm not too sure if some of the people want to discuss the point or just want to uh, share the information. Uh, there's Angelique about uh, lichen and the and versus birch article, and Jeff has a question, I guess, about the Boletus mushroom. Jeff, right? Do you want to go ahead, Jeff? You're you're on mute. Jeff, press your space bar. I did. Sp- thank you very much. I did press the space bar, but it decided to just keep on chatting. Anyway, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you guys who like Lawrence and Kathy and others who've um, hunted up in the Alpine and Subalpine and up north, obviously, um, have found Boleta species, like in particular the uh, the Edulis or the, I guess it's uh, Subalpinus that grows up in uh, the Rockies there and have had the same one or similar ones on the Engelman spruce and the black spruce up north. Does that make uh, any sense? Well, I, I'm i not, as I indicated in my talk, I'm not terribly familiar with, uh, oh, the camera has just, it, it, it has happened again, David. I. Uh, we can see your face, Lawrence, it's okay. That's okay, good. Um, I'm not familiar with alpine, subalpine, Oh, you're on mute now. Yep. Un- um, ask to unmute. I don't think it possibly answer in the meanwhile and while you unmute uh, Well, I can say for the for the Alpine, um, we've found Lexinum rotundifolii, which is an Alpine species. And I have seen Boletus edulis in Alaska in Dryas. So no that problem. was kind of tree line, border tree line, alpine, low alpine. And I was really surprised to see it. And then I remembered that Orson Miller had written an article um, quite a while ago, and he mentioned the Boletus in Dryas in Alaska. And, and it was almost the same place that I happened on. So, wow. so I know I, with Dryas, it occurs with Dryas. I found it with Dryas in both the Yukon and uh, Labrador. Oh, Boletus edulis. Boletus edulis, yes. Oh, That's oh. exciting. And otherwise, uh, it seems like it's mostly Lexinums of the Arctic Alpine. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Knox and Willis. Knox Willis. Oddly enough, I mean, they're, they're, it's subarctic uh, 
pines, uh, which Suilus grows with, but oddly enough, one doesn't find much Suilus uh, far north. Uh, that's possible. The Chinams, though, are, uh, and I, I, Kathy may know the reason for this, but uh, uh, they are amongst the most abundant as well as most corpulent of all Arctic fungi. They're with the birch, wherever They're, you find the birch. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, they are. And there as I go. said, I've seen them. They're, they're collected by people in Siberia by the ton, marinated and eaten in the winter with all sorts of foods. Uh, <laughs> and Which is that? Sorry? Which mushroom is that? Uh, the Lexinum. There's, uh, there's several different Lexinum species, including Rotentifolia, uh, Insigne, uh, Scabrum, etc., that they uh, tend to collect. And it is their definition of mushroom because there are not a lot of other seemingly edible species. Um, so, um, you know, and I found, as I said, I have found gigantic. I have one, a Lexinum from Alaska, and I am not making this up. It could be a Guinness record. The cap was 17 inches across. Holy moly. Yes. Yes. I thought the same thing. I'll tell you, I wish I could eat Lexinums, but I sure can't. They do not agree with me. They taste great, but they do not agree with me. Uh, well, uh, I think it's, it's, they're not all, some of them, um, try, uh, well, I think it's Orient, uh, Orient uh that's the one that has uh, various toxins in it. Um, and I found that, uh, just talking to people, um, mostly in the stipe, maybe try eating the cap and see what happens. <laughs> if you want to be sick again. <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of poisonings with it. I used to eat them for years without a problem. Some of the poisonings were eating them raw or undercooked, but it yeah. doesn't explain some of the others, so I don't know. Well, did you, a variety of species would result in the poisonings, not just one or two? We couldn't nail it down. Um, wow. So we don't. I believe, I believe Bob Bromley has a question. Bob? Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? No. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I, You're very uh, welcome. I'm, I'm calling in from Yellowknife, so uh, much of what you were talking about uh, uh, certainly sounded familiar from what uh, from what I've seen uh, on the tundra and in the subarctic. We, uh, your uh, the the chat about the Lucinum. Uh, I had a friend that did an 800 kilometer trek across uh, a single esker across the Northwest Territories in the tundra. And he said he was eating three platefuls a day, three frying pans full a day of the Luxinum. So, <laughs> but he seemed to do well. So, <laughs> interesting. Um, the, uh, we also had a talk uh, last fall. I can't remember, maybe David or somebody, I can't remember the name of the mycologist from Washington State. That talked about mushrooms in the subarctic. Uh, oh, that's the uh, Laura Lee Novell. Indeed. Yeah, Laura and, Lee. Uh, yeah, she was doing a lot of uh, a lot of genetic work uh, to try and pinpoint some of the identifications. Uh, has there been much genetic work? Do you know, uh, Lawrence, in Arctic mushrooms generally? Uh, there's been some, uh, but like everything else with respect to Arctic mushrooms. Um, it's behind the rest of the world. You know, they're really, I mean, one of the things I would, um, uh, would have said in this talk, if I had thought about saying it, is more monitoring needs to be done. More work needs to be done. More genetic work needs done. More collecting needs to be done. More determining of what species might be red listed needs to be done. There's, there's very little, um, Work. And I often think that, it, you know, if, when, when one thinks of the, the um, feelings, uh, possibly the horror that some people have about heading north, um, it goes all the way back to the ice ages and, uh, you know, the fear of survival, even though they may be staying in an eco lodge, there's a certain gene uh, that they might possess uh, that uh, tells them to watch out. Uh, as it told, it told their early Pleistocene ancestors to watch out. But uh, no, there has been some work and it's, there's been a lot in Scandinavia. 
Uh, there's been quite a bit in Iceland, uh, some in North America, but not as much as in uh, Northern Europe, and especially Norway. Kathy has done some. <laughs> yeah, I know. I so know. we've yeah. done um, molecular work for 16 species of Hebeloma in the Alpine, many of them the same in the, in the Arctic. We did that with Henry Becker. And of course. Yes. Um, we have a couple papers on um, Arctic and uh, Alpine lactarius. Uh, we're just coming up with the Rushulas now. That'll be next. And Inosobes. And we've done some on Cortinarius. And it's some of the first molecular work that actually shows that intercontinental distribution. Lawrence is right. They've done a lot of work in um, Scandinavia, especially Ellen Larson, but connecting it up with North America. Yeah. There hasn't been much. So we've been having a lot of fun doing that because nobody was doing it. Uh, I would like uh, to say something. Uh, uh, if you want to do the uh, DNA work, you have to do some collecting. And that's uh, what SWIMS is able to do. Please collect. Uh, and collect and get it into the herbaria. I believe Angelique has a question. You'll have to unmute yourself, Angelique. Yes, I was just wondering about uh, whether the endoecto line is moving north um, for mycorrhizal fungi and um, what Lawrence thinks of that. Well, I, I mentioned what I thought of that. It is indeed moving north, uh, but there are so many factors that, that have to be considered uh, with this move north. Uh, namely, as they are moving north, what, what kind of competition from northern species will they get? Because as you probably know, mycorrhizal fungi are extremely competitive. They, they go, they release uh, different compounds to other mycorrhizal fungi that say, stay away, this is my food. Uh, and as I indicated uh, before, I mean, the, the problem too um, is that uh, the excess nitrogen in the soil might offset the arrival of new mycorrhizal species because many of the plants will say, hey, uh, we don't need any more nitrogen. We're getting it from the soil. Our, our roots are doing a lot better job than they ever did at getting it. You know, they're not commenting on the permafrost melting because they don't have the sense of that. They just have a sense of, well, there's all, this one, all these wonderful nutrients. Uh, so I think the answer to your question is yes, uh, and work needs to be done and it's complicated. And it could be that they're moving north and we'll see a vast variety of species that we never saw before, but we now we see in Florida and Georgia in 50 years, or it might be that conditions nullify that. Okay. All right, thanks for your answer. You're welcome. Any other questions? So I think I'll pass it back to David. And thank you again, Lawrence, for your talk and all the information you conveyed to the many members. Uh, I thank you very much for hosting me. I would like to thank Kathy uh, Cripps as well from Montana for contributing towards the meeting. And Lawrence, thank you very much. Indeed, it was most education. And My I will be phoning you tomorrow morning. All right, I know it's late for you now. Uh, and I need to join Anne Henderson in some whiskey. And she's oh. not sharing. So good night, everybody. And night. don't yeah, forget. Thank you very much. It was great. There's no meeting uh, now till September, but possibly something coming, which I'll notify you about. Excellent. Night, thank everybody. You. It's thank been you, great. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.